Okay, well, just a privilege to be with you this evening. I'm, I'm happy to be back and talk about the ultimate proof of creation. This is one of my favorites to give. You know, when we're, when we're out there witnessing, we want people to come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. That's why we do what we do. And, uh, of course, people have the impression that science is somehow antagonistic to the Bible, and that's why it's so important that we have presentations like Dr. Snelling just gave, and I do some on astronomy, where we show people that the science confirms that God's Word is true. And as we, and as we go about doing evangelism and showing people, hey, you need Jesus to be saved, there are objections that come out. That people say, oh, no, you can't trust the Bible anymore because of… then they come up with these pseudoscientific arguments. Apologetics is about helping people over those stumbling blocks. And it's very useful to study some of these lines of scientific evidence and geology and astronomy and biology and so on. But people have said, boy, there's all this information out there. Is there one argument I can use that just… that settles the issue? And I've got good news for you because there is. There is, a, there is a, an ultimate proof of creation, an argument that absolutely demonstrates that creation is true for which there is no rebuttal. And I want to share that with you today. It's a, it's a method that works every time, and by works, I mean there's, there's, there's no response to it. There's no logical response. I'm going to show you that the Christian worldview, beginning with biblical creation, is the only rational possibility. Any alternative to that is self-refuting. It destroys itself. And when you use this argument on people, and I encourage you to do so, you may find that they don't necessarily convert. Some of them might, some of them might not. And that may, people, well, people say, well, then is it really an ultimate proof? And the answer is yes, just because uh, people are not necessarily persuaded by an argument doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the argument necessarily. There's a difference between proof and persuasion. I'm giving you a proof, an objective argument the conclusion of which is that creation is true and there's no rebuttal to it. Now whether or not the person is persuaded, that's a different issue. You can't ultimately persuade people, ultimately. We want to be persuasive in the way we present things, but it's up to the Holy Spirit to bring persuasion. See my job is not to bring persuasion. People get confused by that. They think, well, I want to work on people's heartstrings, and no, no, that's up to God. Let God be God. Let Him do that. It's our job to give a defense. That's what the Bible tells us. We're to be ready to give an answer, and I've got a great argument for you, one that works every time in the sense that the person will not have a rational comeback. Words might come out of his mouth, but he's not going to have a rational comeback. He's not going to be able to defend his faith against the Christian worldview. So you see, just because somebody doesn't cry uncle, that doesn't mean I don't have him in a headlock. That doesn't mean this isn't a really good argument. People are not rigorously rational sometimes, and sometimes they don't embrace an argument that's really good but they will embrace arguments that are bad. That's what logical fallacies are, bad arguments that people tend to find convincing. People say, well, if there's an ultimate proof, then is Christianity a faith system? And the answer is yes. It's just one that's objectively provable. Uh, really? Uh, people confuse faith, what, what the meaning of faith is. Faith is when you have confidence in something that you have not perceived with your senses. Now, I can't perceive creation with my senses, but that doesn't mean I can't demonstrate it objectively. I want to start with some of the scientific evidence, some of which we've covered, some of this will be new, uh, to show you some things that are good to get people to think about uh, creation. For example, laws of information. There's a whole field of information theory, and we find, for example, that when information is transmitted, it can be copied and it can even be lost. But information is never gained in the process of transmission. Dr. Werner Gitt, one of the world's experts on information theory, says when its progress along the chain of transmission events is traced backwards, every piece of information leads to a mental source, the mind of the sender. What he's saying there is if you find a book and it's got information in it, that book might be a copy of a copy of a copy, but ultimately it goes back to a mind. Somebody wrote that. Xerox machine could malfunction and reduce the information in the book. It, it might duplicate it accidentally, but you don't have any new information. You just have duplicated information. But it's not going to add brand new instructions. We sort of know that. And of course, that's interesting because DNA has information in it. DNA has the instructions that make your physical form and perhaps even to some extent your personality and so on. All that encoded on a molecule. Amazing. And how, could, how did that come about? How did you get your instructions? Well, you got it from your parents. They got it from their parents and so on. All the way back to Adam and Eve, and they got it from God. So that, that information's been copied many times, but it goes back to a mind. It's not possible for it to be the result of mutations in natural selection because information always comes from a mind, according to the laws of information theory. 
Uh, in fact, mutations don't help. They might, oh, they might convey survival value under certain circumstances, but they don't add brand new information. Dr. Lee Spetner confirms that. He says all point mutations that have been studied on a molecular level turn out to reduce the genetic information, not to increase it. He says not even one mutation has been observed that adds a little information to the genome. You know, it's possible to improve your survival in certain circumstances by removing information from the genome. That's how, that's how these so-called helpful mutations work. But they can't drive evolution because they're not adding any new instructions to your DNA. So you see, genetics confirms creation. It does not confirm millions of years of evolution. Not at all. We could talk about the age of the Earth. Dr. Snelling's already talked a lot about that. I like coming back to the C14 example, the fact that you find C14 in diamonds. They can't be billions of years old, like the evolutionists would, would like them to be. They can't be that old because C14 doesn't last that long. If the entire Earth were nothing but C14, after one million years, you wouldn't have a single atom of it left. That's how quick it decays. And so they can't even be one million years old, let alone billions. I find this really compelling, the fact that you find just about everything has carbon in it that we can dig up. If it has sufficient carbon, it'll have C14 in it. So it tells me the entire Earth, you see, is not millions of years old, let alone billions. So geology confirms biblical creation and a recent flood, worldwide flood. It doesn't confirm millions of years of slow, gradual processes. Comets. They disintegrate quickly. They cannot last millions of years. They just can't because that material is being blasted away by solar heat and radiation. In fact, that's what forms the comet's tail. That's material that the comet's losing, and it can't do that forever. A typical comet can last no more than 100,000 years maximum before it's gone. And it may seem, with all these lines of evidence, that I've refuted evolution, that I've proved that creation is true, but it re I really haven't. Because for every one of these lines of evidence, and these are good lines of evidence, don't get me wrong, I wouldn't repeat them if they were fallacious or anything like that, but for every one of these lines of evidence, an evolutionist can always invoke what we might call a rescuing device. He can come up with a hypothesis that protects his worldview from what seems to be contrary evidence. And so, for example, with comets, my secular colleagues are well aware that comets can't last billions of years. They know that. They can do the same math that I can do. But they would say, oh, well, there's this, there must be a comet generator that makes new ones then, you see, which they call an Oort cloud after the guy who came up with the idea. You see, so as the old comets are disintegrated, there's this comet generator that makes new ones, and they, they replace the old ones. So you see, the solar system can be billions of years old after all. How about that? The Oort cloud is supposed to be a big sphere of potential comets orbiting way out beyond the planets where we can't detect it. And every now and then, one of these potential comets is thrown into the inner solar system and becomes a brand new comet. Pretty clever. Now, if I were to ask a secular astronomer, do you have any observational evidence of an Oort cloud? If he's honest, he'll say, well, no. But if he's clever, he'll say, but you can't prove it's not there. And that's true. I can't disprove the existence of an undetectable comet generator. It's undetectable. How could I, how could I do that? And see, for every line of evidence, scientific evidence that you present, there's always going to be a rescuing device. If the person is sufficiently clever, there's going to be a rescuing device. You know, you say, well, the information never, never comes about by chance. Somebody says, well, as, you know, as far as we know, but there could be some unknown mechanism, you see, that, in, that increases the information in DNA. Or um, they'll, you'll say, um, what about the C14 in diamonds? Well, there's some unknown contamination. There's always a rescuing device. And before you get too hard on the evolutionists for having rescuing devices, we need to realize that we have them too. Yeah, if somebody asks you about an alleged contradiction in the Bible, two verses that maybe you're not all that familiar with, your first inclination is not to say, well, yeah, I've got to throw the Bible away. I can't be a Christian anymore. Your first inclination is to say, well, I don't know those two verses real well. Let me get back with you on that. Let me start. There, there's some explanation. Give me time. I'll find it. You see, we all have our rescuing devices. That's not, the, that's not the issue. The issue is the fact that we all have the same evidence, but we interpret it according to our respective worldviews. I don't really blame my secular colleague for inventing an Oort cloud. That's consistent with his belief that the solar system is billions of years old and his observation that there are comets. And then he looks and he says, well, yep, Oort cloud. I, look, I start from you know, creation, God's word is truth. I look, at, um, this, I look and see comets. I say, yep, solar system is young. Makes sense. We have the same evidence, we have different interpretations because of our different worldviews. We all have the same facts. People tend to think of the creation versus evolution debate as who has more facts. Well, we all have the same facts. 
We have access to the same fossils, the same DNA patterns, access to the same stars and galaxies. We do science pretty much the same way, really. I do physics and chemistry pretty much the same way as my secular colleagues and so on. What we have different is our starting point, which you can think of like uh, mental glasses. And of course, um, you know, you put on glasses, it's going to affect the way you see things. A lot of you wear uh, prescription lenses. I like to think of the Bible like prescription lenses designed just for you. You put those on, the world snaps into focus, you see things as they are because the Bible is the correct view of history, so it's like corrective lenses. I like to think of evolution like red glasses. You put on red glasses, you're going to say, well, the world is red. Everything's red. No, it, it really isn't, but that's what you're going to think because you've you got those glasses on. That's going to affect your way of thinking. And I realize my evolutionary colleagues will say, oh, no, we're wearing the right glasses. You're wearing the wrong glasses. We're going to have to argue for that. My point is we all have mental glasses. We all have a way of thinking about things that consists of our presuppositions. That those are your most basic beliefs about reality, the rules of interpretation that you assume at the outset before any investigation of the evidence. Before you begin to do any experiment on a rock or whatever to find out what it's made of or how old it is, whatever, you already come to that with some beliefs. Yes, you do. Nobody comes to the evidence neutrally. For example, the belief that your senses are basically reliable. You don't come to the rock and think, you know, I'm going to do some experiments on that rock, but you know, it's probably not even there. Just because I see it, it's pro my senses probably are not reliable. You don't assume that. Uh, that's, that's, that's taken for granted. The reliability of your memory. I mean, some of you are thinking, well, my memory's not so reliable, but presumably you think that the memories you do have actually happened. Isn't that right? How do you know that? How do you know your memory's reliable? You might say, well, Dr. Lyle, I took a test two weeks ago. I got an A on it. It was a memory test. Did very well on it. How do you know you took a memory test two weeks ago, right? You say, well, I remember, to, well, you see my point, you'd have to already assume that your memory's reliable in order to even argue for it. That's the nature of a presupposition. Can't get away from that. They're, ne they're necessary. Or that there are laws of logic and so on. These are all things that we take for granted. Now, some people might say, oh, no, not me. I don't have these presuppositions. I come to the evidence neutrally. I don't have beliefs about evidence. That's the way we should do things. And my response would be, well, that's a very interesting belief about how things should be interpreted, isn't it? You see, the philosophy that we should come to the evidence without a philosophy is itself a philosophy. It's just a really bad one because it's self-refuting. Now, the kicker is creationists and evolutionists have competing worldviews. We have different sets of presuppositions, different rules for interpreting the evidence. And as a result of that, we come to different conclusions. That's where the battleground lies. It's about worldviews. And we have an ultimate standard that drives our worldview. For the creationist, the Bible is the ultimate standard, or at least it should be. And that we should interpret all evidence in light of what God has said in His Word. If it really is the infallible Word of God, we better pay attention to that. We should base our thinking on it. Now, I have secondary standards as well. I do believe that my senses are basically reliable. But that's not my ultimate standard because I know my senses can be fooled. Ever seen an optical illusion? And you know it can't be real because you've got a greater presupposition that tells you, well, that's impossible, even though I see it. My senses are not my ultimate standard. The Bible's my ultimate standard. What about for the evolutionist? What is his or her ultimate standard? There are different varieties of evolutionists out there, but often naturalism is their ultimate standard or, alternatively, strict empiricism, usually one of those two. Naturalism is the belief that nature's all that there is. And therefore, you can't allow for miracles or anything supernatural when you're doing science. Or, when, or sometimes they'll say you can't, you can't allow for it at all. Others, others say, well, methodologically, you can't allow for it. When you're doing science, you can't, you can't invoke the supernatural. That's a philosophy, folks. Or strict empiricism, the belief that all truth claims are answered empirically by observation. If you want to know something, do an experiment. Well, I believe some truth claims are answered that way, but not all of them. See, the problem is a lot of people want to try and use scientific evidence to prove the Bible's true, and I want to suggest that's not the right approach. The, the scientific evidence is used to show people that, that we really have a worldview that connects with reality. It confirms Scripture. Evidence by itself is never decisive when it comes to a worldview issue, and that's because your worldview tells you what to make of the evidence. And I have a silly illustration for this I like to use. There was a man who was convinced that he was dead. He thought that he himself was dead. He's really upset about this. He doesn't like being dead. And his doctor's trying to convince him, look, fellow, you're perfectly healthy. You're, you're walking and talking. And the guy thinks, yeah, but bodies can have muscle spasms even after clinical death. That could explain my ability to walk and talk. 
The doctor says, but look, I have medical charts showing you're perfectly healthy. And the guy says, yeah, but uh, medical charts can be falsified and maybe the name got swapped and who knows if you're interpreting that right anyway. The doctor thinks, okay, I'm going to prove to you that you're not dead. Do dead men bleed? And the guy thinks about it. Well, no, the circulatory system would be stopped. No, dead men don't bleed. The doctor very quickly takes a little pin, pricks the guy in the hand. Sure enough, a little blood comes to the surface. See, you're bleeding. And, of course, the man responds, well, how about that? I guess dead men do bleed. Right? Did the doctor have evidence of his position? Sure. Guy could walk and talk, medical charts, guy could bleed. Did they persuade the guy? No, because his worldview that he was dead told him how to interpret each of those lines of evidence. And that's exactly the way it is when it comes to a worldview debate. Absolutely. You can present evidence that's as powerful as you, as, as you can imagine. If it doesn't deal with the person's worldview, they're just going to reinterpret it according to their worldview. People don't need more evidence, more reasons to believe. That's not what they need. What they need is that their worldview challenged. That's what it comes down to. You might have great evidence. See how this evidence confirms the Bible is true? And you should do some of that. You should point that out to people. I think fossils are fantastic evidence of the worldwide flood. That's what I'd expect. But that's because I'm looking at it properly through the lens of Scripture. My secular colleague, what's he going to say? Uh, well, that's not how I see it. He'll come up with some rescuing device to explain that fossil or whatever the evidence is on his worldview. And the funny thing is we're inclined to think, well, yeah, I guess that wasn't a, such a good evidence. Wasn't, it didn't convince him after all. So we, we said, well, let's try something else then, right? Let's try make more evidence. Well, that'll do the trick. And look, look how canyons can form quickly. And, and uh, you know, how about this? And he says, well, no, that's not how I see it. Just because that one formed quickly doesn't mean they all do. Well, look, rock layers can be laid down quickly. Mount St. Helens demonstrated that. He says, well, just because those ones do doesn't mean these ones do. But look, animals reproduce after their kind. That's what we'd expect. He says, yeah, but given enough time, one kind will change into another. Or what about information in DNA? Well, we don't know how that got there, but give us time, we'll find it. Mutations do it somehow. Oh, but there's comets out in space. No problem, there's an Oort cloud. You see? Don't get me wrong, it's not wrong to show people evidence and how the Bible makes sense of it. In fact, I think we should do some of this. I do some talks along those lines. I think it's important because we live in a culture where people think that the Bible's anti-science. They think that to be scientific is to be unbiblical. We need to show them that there is a biblical way to look at things, to look at the evidence. That's important. But my point is, if that's all you're doing, if you're up against a sufficiently clever person, it's not going to be persuasive to him, nor, nor should it be, because you haven't proved anything. All you've done is said, we can look at it this way. Okay, but he can look at it this way. A philosophically astute person will not be persuaded by mere evidence, nor should he, because that's not what the debate's about. It's about worldviews. It's perfectly good to show people evidence and how the Bible makes sense of it, but this by itself will not resolve a debate over worldviews because your worldview tells you what to make of the evidence. And why is it that we don't get this for the most part? I think it's because we spend most of our time with people that have the same, basically the same worldview that we have. And when you have the same worldview, yeah, you can use evidence by itself to persuade people because they'll interpret it the same way you do. They got the same worldview. If you and I have a disagreement over the price of eggs, we can go to the store and we can look at the price and we can say, yeah, we, you know, okay, I was right. See, there's the price. But if I'm arguing with somebody who has a, a Hindu worldview, right, he believes that the, the world is all illusion, all maya, and I say, well, see, I'm right. He says, nope, that's illusion too. If you've got a different worldview, you can't just throw evidence at people and expect them to change their mind. You have to, you have to deal with those worldviews. We have to challenge, not on this level, because we all have the same evidence, we have to challenge on this level. We have to get back to the worldview issue. So how are we going to get anywhere then? I'm standing on my biblical presuppositions. My friend is standing on his secular presuppositions. We can't just throw evidence at each other because we're always going to interpret it in light of our worldview, our presuppositions. So how do we get anywhere? Before I give you the right answer, I want to give you the wrong answer because evolutionists often will say, well, let's meet on neutral ground. Surely there are some things we can agree on, somewhere in the middle, neutral things. And, but, but I don't agree that the Bible is the Word of God, so you've got to give that up. And a lot of Christians are persuaded by that. They think, well, yeah, if he doesn't believe in the Bible, I guess I can't use the Bible, right? Is that really logical? If the guy said, I, I don't believe in logic, would you say, well, I guess I can't use logic to debate with you then? If he says, I don't believe in air, would you hold your breath? If he doesn't believe in the Bible, that's his problem, right? 
But anyway, a lot of Christians are fooled by this. They think, well, yeah, we have to leave the Bible out of the discussion, just stick to science, because that's all he believes in. Let's meet on neutral ground. The problem is there is no neutral ground. The Bible makes that clear. Jesus says, who is not with me is against me, and who does not gather with me scatters. You're with Christ or you're against him, you see. And the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. It's not neutral toward God, it's hostile toward God. Do you not know that friendship with the world is, what, neutrality to God? No, it's hostility toward God. You get the picture? You're God's friend or his enemy. You're with him, you're against him. You're gathering, you're scattering. There is no neutral. And so Dr. Bonson liked to call that the pretended neutrality fallacy, the idea that we can sort of pretend to be neutral. But the Bible says there's no such thing. And so the claim of neutrality is itself unbiblical because it contradicts Scripture. See, the Bible says there's no neutral when it comes to an ultimate standard. And if you say, oh, yes, there is neutral and I'm neutral, well, you've just said the Bible's wrong, in which case you're not being neutral. You've taken a position. The nature of the claim forces us to be with God or against God. So if somebody says, yeah, let's meet on neutral ground, leave the Bible out of the discussion, we, we certain things we agree on, like science and so on, we can talk about those issues. And you say, yeah, okay, we can leave the Bible out of the discussion, and I'll show you that creation's true, and the Bible really is the Word of God, and it's infallible. But neutral ground is secular ground. The Bible says there's no such thing. And if you agree to those terms, you've lost. Because you see, the whole debate is about whether or not the Bible really is the Word of God. That's what origins really is all about. Can God be trusted when He says what He says in Scripture? And the Bible says there's no neutral. If you begin the debate by saying that the Bible's wrong, at least about neutrality, how are you going to end the debate by saying the Bible's right about everything? You can't abandon what you're trying to defend and expect to win the debate. This is a terrible way to start a debate, by conceding defeat, right? You can't defend biblical authority by abandoning biblical authority. I'm going to stand on the Word of God, and if he says, well, I, I don't believe in that, I'm going to say, well, that's, that's your problem. <laughs> I'm not going to be foolish just because you're rejecting God, God and his standard. People like to think they're very neutral, and they're going to ask you to be neutral. Two things to remember when people ask you to be neutral. One, they're not. Two, you shouldn't be. God hasn't called us to be neutral. He's called us to be Christians. We're supposed to stand on the authority of the Word. Right? To exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict, we hold fast the faithful Word. And they'll say, well, that's circular reasoning. You can't do that. You can't stand on what you're trying to defend. Of course, the evolutionist is standing on evolution while he defends that. He doesn't seem to realize that little problem. But uh, it seems to me when it comes to an ultimate standard, you have to stand on what you're defending. You can't stand on something else because there's no greater standard, right? You can stand on what you're defending. In battle, if you're defending a hill, you can stand on the hill while you're defending the hill. That's a great place to be. You ever had something in your eye? You can look in a mirror and use your eye to examine your eye and correct your eye. There's nothing illogical about that. People don't really understand the nature of what, what constitutes an arbitrary fallacy of begging the question and what is consistent reasoning uh, w within a particular worldview. All right, how do we get anywhere then? We can't, we can't meet on neutral ground because there's no such thing. You're either with God or against Him. We can't just throw evidence at each other. How do we get anywhere in this debate? By recognizing that biblical presuppositions and only biblical presuppositions make knowledge possible. People like to think they know things, and people do know lots of things, but that's only possible in a Christian worldview with biblical creation at its foundation. And that's something that the Bible itself teaches us tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. You want to begin to know anything? It's got to start with God's presuppositions, the Christian worldview. You reject the Christian worldview, you reject Christian presuppositions, the Bible says you're a fool. You can't know anything because all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ, the Bible tells us in Colossians 2, 3. Not some. All. You want to know anything? You got to submit to God's presuppositions. There's an objection to this because people will say, well, wait a minute. I know some non-Christians and they do know some things. And that's true. But that's because they do know God. And they do, to some extent, act on his presuppositions. Christian presuppositions. Oh, yes, they do. I'll show you that in more detail later on. But my point is, the reason that unbelievers are able to know things is because they know in their heart of hearts the biblical God and God has hardwired them with some of, with, with Christian presuppositions. They know that and they're able to do it. They just don't do it consistently. They deny the God who makes such presuppositions possible. 
And the Bible tells us that. It's not that people don't have enough knowledge of God. Romans 1 verse 19, because what may be known of God is manifest in them. God has shown it to them. God's revealed himself. That's not the problem. The problem is, verse 18, that they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. They take what they know to be true, they suppress it. The things of God are clearly seen, according to Scripture, so that there is no excuse. They're without excuse, without an apologetic, is how that's literally uh, translated, by the way. Only the Bible can make sense of things necessary for knowledge. That's my argument. Simple argument, really. And I'm going to show you how that, how that works out here. My proof of the Bible and biblical creation, the foundation of Scripture, if the Bible were not true, it would be impossible to prove that anything is true. Because the Bible alone makes sense of those things that are necessary for knowledge. There are certain things that have to already be true in order for you to have knowledge. For example, the reliability of your senses. You really couldn't learn much about the universe if your senses were not reliable. If you're just a brain in a jar being fed input and all this is just illusion, you can't know anything about the real universe. So that's a, what we call a precondition of intelligibility. It's something that has to be true in advance for you to know anything about anything. And I'm going to point out that only the Bible can make sense of those preconditions of intelligibility, like the reliability of my senses. God made my senses. Of course they're going to be basically reliable. Maybe not perfectly reliable. We live in a cursed, fallen world now. But, but still, there's, a, there's a, a remnant of creation there. I want to hit just three briefly, and one in more detail. Laws of logic. We need laws of logic in order to have knowledge, don't we? You use laws of logic every day. You couldn't get out of bed without laws of logic. You think, I think I'm going to get out of bed and get a shower, but wait a minute, maybe I'm already in the shower. No, no, no. You know because you're here, you're not there. You're using, you're using logic. And we, we do that instinctively. It's not a problem. But laws of logic are rooted in the character and nature of God. Do you realize that? People don't think about that, but it's true. Why is it that two contradictory statements cannot both be true? Why is that? It's because God doesn't deny himself, the Bible says. God is self-consistent. And therefore, truth, which stems from God and his nature, will always be self-consistent. And so we have a law of non-contradiction. And we know it will always be that way because God does not change. We know that law applies everywhere because God is omnipresent. See, laws of logic are, are a reflection of the way God thinks and the way that we must think if we're going to learn truth, if we're going to have knowledge. So laws of logic make sense. We have a standard for correct reasoning, and that standard is God. But in an evolutionary universe, why would there be a standard of correct reasoning? Who decides what that is? Why would there be laws at all if there's no lawgiver, laws of logic in particular? Why would they have the properties that they do, like not changing with time and not changing with space? in a random chance of universe. That's what I want to know. Or uniformity in nature, not to be confused with uniformitarianism. Uniformitarianism is the belief that rates and conditions have always sort of been the same. We've seen evidence this evening that that's not the case. But uniformity is just the idea that there's an underlying orderliness in nature, what we might call laws, laws of nature, laws of science. Why would there be laws of nature in a chance universe? That's what I want to know. Why would they stay the same? Why would they apply at all times? Why are, why are they often described by nice, neat little equations like E equals MC squared? That's kind of convenient, isn't it? Almost as if it was designed to be understood by the human mind. Now, that makes sense in a Christian worldview because God upholds the universe by the word of his power. He does it in a consistent way that we can understand. But if the universe is just chance, there's no reason why science should even be possible because there's no basis for laws of nature, and that's what science seeks to uncover. Absolute morality. I'm going to spend most of the time on this one because I think it's the easiest to understand. Most, you know, laws of logic, people haven't thought about that too much consciously. Or, you know, that why is science possible? Most people haven't given too much thought to that. But most people have thought about right and wrong. And some people have very staunch opinions on what's right and what's wrong. And so that's a great way to start in terms of uh, thinking through what's, what's possible. But you see, my point here is that right and wrong only makes sense in a Christian worldview. Right? Because we have a lawgiver who tells us what's right and wrong, and God will hold us accountable for our actions. So I have a very good reason to behave in a particular way. And of course, God has revealed himself to us in, in the text of Scripture. That's why it has to be the Christian God. It can't just be any old God. It's God who's revealed himself, God who made us in his image, God who will hold us accountable for our actions, the Christian God. But you see, if we're just rearranged pond scum, why would you have absolute morality? 
what one chemical does to another is morally irrelevant. Now, my point is not that evolutionists don't believe in these things. My point is they do, and yet they have no foundation for them on their professed worldview. So my atheist friend says, you don't have to be a Christian to use laws of logic. I believe in laws of logic. My counter would be, but you shouldn't on your worldview. You don't have any reason to believe in laws of logic on your worldview. You don't have, they don't have any justification. You can't account for them or their properties. So well, we all know that you can't have, that contradictions can't be true. Why on your worldview? I've got a reason because God doesn't deny himself. What's your explanation for that? He says, well, I've never seen a true contradiction. I say, hey, I've never seen Australia, but my friend assures me it's there, right? <laughs> See, just because you haven't seen something happen doesn't mean it's impossible. Only the Christian can say contradictions are always impossible because of the nature of God. He's relying upon that truth, but on his worldview, he can't account for it. He's, st he's standing on this worldview, really, to account for it. Or science. Why would science be possible in a changing, random chance universe? And he says, oh, but there's right and wrong. And I say, yeah, but who decides on your worldview? How do you account for right and wrong? What does that even mean in your worldview? People pick worldviews a lot of times like they pick cars. What, what's your preference? Do you like blue? Do you like flame color? Take your pick. Do you like the biblical worldview or the secular one? But the fact is, when we examine worldviews carefully, we're going to find the biblical worldview makes sense. When we open it up, it can go somewhere. It can lead to knowledge. It's self-consistent. It works. The secular worldview, when we examine it carefully, can't possibly work. It cannot lead to knowledge. It's empty, empty philosophy. It's not a philosophy that leads to knowledge. And the way you expose that is you do what's called an internal critique. You evaluate the worldview on its own terms. For example, uh, relativism. You familiar with this idea? The idea that oh, everything's relative. There's no, there's no, there are no absolutes. All things are relative. And of course, the question you want to ask a relativist is, are you absolutely certain? Right? The claim that there are no absolutes is an absolute claim. If it's true, it's false. Therefore, it's false. Really easy to refute relativism. Strict empiricism. A lot of evolutionists are strict empiricists. Surprising number of them. Not all of them, but surprising number of them. That's their philosophy. They say all truth claims are proved by empirical observation. You want to know something? Go out and do an experiment. Look with your own eyes and so on. That's how we know what's true. Observation, that's the key. And of course, I believe some truth claims are answered that way, but not all of them. They would say, well, you can't take anything on authority. You can't trust the Bible because you can't see God and you can't touch him and so on, so you shouldn't believe in him. But it's interesting because this claim itself, all truth claims are proved by empirical observation, that sentence is itself a truth claim, isn't it? And so I'm going to ask, how do you know that the statement itself is, is true? Did you prove it by empirical observation? Did you observe all truth claims? By the way, you can't observe a truth claim. They're, they're conceptual. You can't see them. And, you, and even if you could, you certainly couldn't see all of them. So how does he know this is true? He says, well, I don't know it's true. Well, then he, there's no reason for me to believe it. And if he proves it some other way, then it's false, right? It refutes itself on its own terms. You can't observationally prove that all truth claims are proved by observation. It's impossible. And so what we'll find is secular worldviews, any worldview aside from Christianity, blows itself up on its own terms. All you have to do is push the unbeliever to be consistent with what he says he believes, and it will circle back around and blow itself up, because only the fear of the Lord leads to knowledge. That's what it comes down to. So it may seem like we have an impasse, because I'm standing on my biblical presuppositions, my secular colleague is standing on his secular presuppositions. It seems, it seems like we can't get anywhere. There's no neutral ground. Can't just throw evidence at each other. But what we find is that secular presuppositions can't support a worldview. They're inconsistent. They will not make possible science or logic or morality or any number of other things, reliability of senses and what have you. Of course, this is what the Bible teaches us, right? It's the, it's the words of Jesus that you have to build your house on for it to stand. Everything else, sinking sand. And when that sand dissolves away, the unbeliever has a problem. He cannot stand on his own view. So what's he going to do? He's going to stand on the Christian worldview. Oh, yeah. Unbelievers do stand on Christian presuppositions because they have to. They couldn't survive in this universe without embracing God's laws of logic, without recognizing his uniformity and therefore the laws of nature that we find, without recognizing some sort of objective morality. He's standing on Christian principles. He's, he's stealing from our worldview. He's stealing, he's stealing Christian presuppositions. Unbelievers are 
presuppositional kleptomaniacs. They, they compulsively steal from the Christian worldview. They can't help themselves. They have to because they've got to live in God's universe. He might deny being made in the image of God, but he can't escape being made in the image of God. That's what it comes down to. And so I'm going to point out that inconsistency and say, hey, you're, you're standing on Christian ground. He's going to say, no, no, I'm not. Laws of logic, that's not a Christian worldview. It's not a Christian presupposition, but really it is. He can't account for it on his own worldview. And all I'm going to do is point out the inconsistency. Okay, I'm not trying to save him. I can't do that. Only Jesus can do that. I'm just pointing out the inconsistency. I'm saying, look, fellow, you're standing on God's property. You either need to get saved or stop trespassing. That's what it comes down to. We pray you'll get saved, but that's between you and God. I'm just pointing out the inconsistency. You see, a debate over biblical creation is a lot like a debate over the existence of air. Can you imagine people arguing about whether or not air exists? What would the critic of air say? Is up there giving all these elaborate arguments. Oh, there's no such thing as air. All the while breathing air and expecting that we can hear his argument as it's transmitted, as the sound is transmitted through the air. You see, the critic of air must use air to make a case against air. The fact that he's able to make an argument at all proves that he's wrong. And so it is with the critic of the Bible. A critic of the Bible must use biblical presuppositions in order to argue against the Bible. The fact that he's able to make his argument proves that his argument is wrong. Isn't that interesting? And of course, people might try to come back from that. Well, wait a minute. Yeah. I don't need the Bible to use things like logic and so on. Well, the, unless the Bible's true, you couldn't make sense of logic. It's kind of like the person who says, wait a minute, I don't, you're telling me air has to exist, I need air to breathe? That can't be, because I don't even believe in air, and I can breathe just fine, right? No, 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 you still need air to breathe. I'm not saying you have to profess a belief in air to breathe, but you do need air to breathe. I'm not saying you have to profess a belief in the Bible to have knowledge, but the Bible must be true in order for you to have knowledge. And so he's standing on the Christian worldview, using Christian presuppositions to argue against Christianity, and that is not going to work out well for him. If he's successful in arguing against Christianity, then he won't have the very presuppositions he needs to do science, logic, morality, and so on. Let's zoom in on just one of these, morality. It makes sense, right? If God created us, then he has the right to set the rules. Uh, but if God didn't create us, if you just rearrange pond scum, make, why not make up your own rules? And some people might say that's right, morality is relative, but they can't live that way. If I pull a gun on them and say, why shouldn't I pull the trigger? Go ahead, make my day. Right? If they say, well, yeah, I guess I, you know, if they say, well, no, you can't do that because there's this absolute moral code, well, they've made my day. They've proved my point. And if they say, well, yeah, I can't give you a reason, then I pull the trigger and I win the debate that way. Either way, I'm winning. there's no laws of logic in an evolutionary worldview anyway. There's no reason why you can't win a debate by simply shooting your opponent. I wouldn't do that because that's, I have a Christian worldview, but my point is he can't give me a good counterargument. How do you decide right from wrong? Apart from the biblical God, morality can only be relative, but people cannot live that way. They just can't. What are some possible responses? Oh, you don't need, you don't need the Bible to explain morality, he says. He says, good is what brings the most happiness to the most people. And my question would be, why? If people are just rearranged pond scum, why should I be concerned about their happiness? It's just a chemical reaction in their brain, right? I'm not really concerned about chemistry. I'm not really, you know, you go to a, a, you know, some baking soda and you say, boy, you know, are you happy? I want to, I want to make sure that you're happy. It's just chemistry, right? You wouldn't, it doesn't make any sense. And even here, he's borrowing on the Christian worldview, isn't he? He's saying that you don't need the Bible to account for Right and wrong, just do unto others what, what you would have them do unto you, right? I think I've heard that somewhere before. He's borrowing on the Christian worldview. Yeah, we should be concerned about the happiness of others because they're made in the image of God. The, even this only makes sense in a Christian worldview. He can't account for it. Somebody told me, he says, well, the, the moral code's just, that's just the chemistry of the brain. And I said, then why should I follow it, right? If it's just chemistry, my stomach's got some chemistry going on, maybe I should use my indigestion to tell me right from wrong, right? It doesn't make any sense. Somebody says, well, laws of morality are, are conventions adopted for the benefit of society. We need laws in society. Otherwise, people would go around acting, you want to say, what, like animals? Because isn't that what we are in the evolutionary worldview? And who decides what benefits society? Hitler had some ideas about that, and I, I don't think we would argue that what he did was right. Not at all. So you see that he can't defend it apart from the scriptural standard. Consider an evolutionist who's outraged at seeing a violent murder on television. He says, I can't believe that, man. 
shot that little girl, that's terrible. Now, I'm glad he's upset, but my point is, on his worldview, it doesn't make sense. Why should he be angry? In his worldview, it's just one chemical accident getting rid of another chemical accident. What's the big deal? You rack the baking soda with the vinegar and it fizzes up. Do you get angry at it? You say, bad baking soda, you shouldn't have done that. Not if it's just chemistry. If we're just animals, what one animal does to another is morally irrelevant. The lion kills the antelope. You don't put the lion in jail. You better think about what you did. Animals do what animals do. So you see, standing on the Christian worldview, arguing against the Christian worldview, using Christian principles. Doesn't make sense. How can you use this effectively? The don't answer, answer strategy. Very effective. This is a great way to defend the Christian faith. It's, stem, it's right from Scripture, Proverbs 26, 4 and 5. Proverbs 26, 4 says, Do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you also be like him. And the Bible's not just engaging in name-calling. It's not just saying, well, you're just a moron when it uses that term fool. It's using that term to describe someone who is dense, someone who is perhaps very intelligent, but who refuses to use his intellect in the way that God has intended and has been reduced to a silly worldview. The Bible here tells us that we should not embrace the presuppositions of the unbeliever or we'll be like him. Somebody comes to you and says, uh, let's leave the Bible out of the discussion because I don't even believe in the Bible. So we can talk about origins, but stick to science. Should we agree to those terms? No, because if we do, we'll be like him, and we can't really get anywhere, right? We've just given up the Bible that we're trying to defend. We're not supposed to do that. We're not supposed to buy into the presuppositions of the unbeliever, or we'll both be foolish. Then the next proverb says, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. It may sound like a contradiction at first, but it's not because the sense is different. On the one hand, we shouldn't embrace the presuppositions of the unbeliever. On the other hand, we should show where they go so that he can't be wise in his own eyes. We sort of temporarily stand on his standard to show how silly it would be to do so. And so somebody says to you, there are no absolutes. You, you can argue with me, but you can't use any absolute statements because there are no absolutes. Now, I would not embrace that standard or I'd be like him. I'm going to say, no, I don't, I don't agree with your standard, but hypothetically, if there were no absolutes, you couldn't say there are no absolutes. You reflect his philosophy back to him so he can see how ridiculous it is. And then he can't be wise in his own eyes because now he says, oh yeah, I used, I used an absolute statement to say there are no absolute statements. That doesn't make any sense. Let me give you a silly example and then some more realistic ones. Somebody says, I don't believe in words. Prove to me that creation is true, but you can't use words because I don't believe in words. Right? And so you thought, wow, you know, boy, if he didn't believe in words, I guess I can't use words. I'll have to use charades or something. No, 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 no. First, the don't answer part. You're going to say, I don't accept your belief that words don't exist. I reject your standard. But then the, you do the answer part. But hypothetically, if words didn't exist, you couldn't argue anyway. The fact that you're able to make your case demonstrates that it is wrong. You just use words to tell me you don't believe in words. You see, you reflect this philosophy back to him so you can see the absurdity of it. Powerful stuff. What's he going to say now? If he says nothing, then my point stands unrefuted. If he says anything, he proves my point, that words exist. That's a great way to argue. That's why God put it in Scripture for our, for our uh, benefit. Never put on the suit. Never embrace the presuppositions of the unbeliever, but do reflect them back to him so that he can see the absurdity of it. Show how they self-destruct. A few realistic examples here. Somebody says, I believe in naturalism. Nature's all that there is. There's no miracles. Show me logically how the earth could be 6,000 years old. Rather than immediately going to things like, you know, well, C14 and stuff like that, I think that's all good evidence. You could mention some of those, but ultimately you should get to the don't answer, answer strategy. You say, first of all, I don't accept your belief in naturalism. I reject your standard. I don't embrace naturalism. I do accept the supernatural realm. But hypothetically, if naturalism were true, It'd be impossible to prove anything since you can't have laws of logic. Laws of logic. See, naturalist says everything that exists is made up of atoms. But laws of logic are not made up of atoms. They can't exist in a naturalistic worldview. He's trying to use something that can't exist in his own worldview to defend his worldview. It's not going to work. Somebody says, you can't take the Bible seriously. It's full of contradictions. Heard people say that? Rather than getting stuck in the detail, it may be okay to answer a few of those, that's fine, but ultimately you should come back and say, first of all, I don't accept your claim that the Bible has contradictions. I take it as the infallible Word of God. It's not going to have any errors in it, certainly not contradictions. But here's a question people don't think to ask. Hypothetically, why would that be wrong? Hmm. 
oh, everybody knows contradictions are wrong. No, 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 sir. I, as a Christian, know that contradictions are wrong because they're contrary to the nature of God. How do you know that contradictions are always wrong? And they don't, they don't know how to answer that. Their head will explode when you ask them that one. They say, well, I've never seen a true contradiction. Hey, I've never seen Australia. I've never seen, oh, there's lots of stuff I've never seen. That doesn't mean it's impossible. Not at all. How about this one? It's wrong to teach creation in schools while you're lying to children. Don't answer, answer. First of all, I don't accept your claim that teaching creation is lying. Creation's true. I got some books I'd be happy to show you on that topic. Science lines up with it. Science confirms it. But then the answer part. But hypothetically, why would it be wrong to lie to children in your worldview? They're just chemical accidents, right? Why would you worry about lying to chemical accidents, particularly if it benefits my survival value? Why would that be wrong? Well, everybody knows it's wrong. I know it's wrong as a Christian. God tells me not to lie. It's contrary to his nature. How do you account for that fact? I'm glad you believe that lying's wrong, but my point is, on, on your evolutionary worldview, you can't account for that fact. You're stealing from my worldview. Get your own worldview. <laughs> Somebody says, the Christian God's not good. He slaughters innocent children. Look at that Old Testament God going back there, wiping out all those people. Innocent children. See, you're going to zoom in on a couple words here. Good. Innocent. This person is trying to argue from a standpoint of absolute morality, which you cannot have apart from the Christian worldview. Say, so first of all, I don't accept your standard that God is not good. You've got some standard that I don't understand, but for, for, to say that God isn't good is like saying Dr. Lyle isn't very Dr. Lyle-ish. God is as good as he can be because he's the definition of what's good. God is good in the standard of goodness. But hypothetically, apart from God, how can you determine what is good and who are innocent? Those words you just used make no sense on your worldview. That's a great way to defend the faith, very powerful. And if you master this, boy, and it doesn't take long to master this method, folks. If it's new to you, if you haven't heard, if you haven't thought about things this way before, it might seem difficult, but it doesn't. I've been able to teach this stuff to teenagers in a week, and they've got it by the end of the week. They can argue against anybody because they're arguing from Scripture. And that's the way to do it. Stand on God's Word and point out, that the unbeliever has to stand on God's word too in order to make sense of anything. And if you understand that, you can agree with the Apostle Paul and say, where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Indeed, he has. 1 Peter 3.15, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. See how everything, how all truth depends on him. Then you'll be ready always to give a defense, to give an answer to everyone who asks the reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and fear, with gentleness and respect. And again, this may not persuade people to become a Christian, but that's not our job. That's the Holy Spirit's prerogative. As Dr. Bonson liked to put it, it's not our job to open people's hearts. That's up to the Holy Spirit. It's our job to close their mouths. And that's what this method does, and it does it very effectively. And as you get better and better at this, and it doesn't take long to get good at this, not long at all, as you, as you get better at it, you can slice and dice your opponents. It's all the more important to remember with meekness and fear, with gentleness and respect, because the critics are also made in the image of God, even if they deny it. And we should remember that we've all been the fool at one point. And it was only because of God's grace that we're not today. We need to stand on God's word from the beginning. That's the key to defending the Christian faith. Stand on God's word. Point out the unbeliever has to stand on God's word too in order to make sense of anything. Very powerful apologetic method. I've got the details uh, outlined in my book, The Ultimate Proof of Creation. It goes into more detail on these things and, and elaborates. And there's, there's uh, pictures and so on that really help illustrate these, these truths. Uh, very powerful, very powerful. And it doesn't take long. Again, you can, you can learn it in a week, really. It, it, of course, it takes a lifetime to master it, but that's, that's, why, um, that's why I like continuing to think about these sorts of things. J this was the approach that Jesus used in his earthly ministry. That's why he was able to take any argument and turn it around on its head. And the critics, they, they couldn't argue with him. Jesus was not the sort of person you wanted to debate against. Check us out on the web, icr.org, and our student ministry, Your Origins matter. So thank you very much, and I'll be outside in just a few minutes.